All right, it's time for some real talk. I have just spent two days organizing and counting my unread books. Shout out to Danny for helping me out with that. And the final tally of unread books is 720. You don't have to comment to say that's insane. I know. Um, I did unhaul at least 15 books but considering that I know I've asked for proofs that are coming in so it's a uh, concerning it's concerning especially when I have to move which is not a thing yet but you know so I think it's safe to say that I'm going on a book buying ban <laughs> with exception of if I'm working on a project and I need a book for that project, then yeah. But I think just buying books in general as a concept is, is something that I can't do anymore, unless it is truly something that I'm going to read right away, as in I'm going to start reading it the moment I get it. So my commitment to myself is I want that number. So I'm going to do, every time I film a wrap up, I'm going to update you on that number, regardless of what month. So for example, I do need to catch up on filming past months wrap ups, but it doesn't matter that are past months because the books are there. And so I'm going to update you on that number. In at least two months, I want it to be lower. And why can't it be lower right away is because I have books coming in that, fair enough, are free. And it is psychologically easier, I guess, to get rid of books that you didn't pay for. But I still want to read them. And also there is a degree to which I need to read new books for work. Not all of them, but, you know, it, it's a hard balance. Um <laughs> I don't know. I tried to get rid of as many books as I could. Also, there's lots of things that I know I got for my master's that I ended up not reading in full and I thought about getting rid of them. But also, I still find them interesting and so it's hard to let go of them. Um, we'll see where we're at in a couple months or when the time comes, whether I feel like, oh, these are justifiable. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Anyways, that's my update. Cue the intro song. All right, so let's start with three things of which I don't have physical covers, covers, copies. Um, the first one is Laurie and Joe by Amy Arnold. And this I literally read in a day at my shop. And it was really good, actually. It is nominated to this year's Goldsmiths Prize, which, in case you don't remember, uh, years ago I said, oh, I'm going to follow this prize and read every shortlist. And that never materialized. But, you know, within the prizes is one that I follow a lot and that I am really interested in seeing what they nominate, even though some of the latest shortlists have being a bit underwhelming. And by the way, Cypher Press made it, whoop whoop, with Never Was. I think I already said that. I don't know if I said it when... Anyways, um, in my sort of queer book wrap-up, I think, was it when I mentioned it? Never Was by H. Garth Gavin. Mwah. Amazing book, nominated for the Goldsmith Prize. And Laurie and Joe is also really good. The thing is that as I was reading it, I knew... I wouldn't ever want to reread it. It's like a very interesting book, but that's it. And it is about this woman in a old married couple. Well, I don't remember how old they are. No, I think she is older. It reminded me a little bit of um, the faster I walk, the smaller I am. Um, except this is not really humorous in that same way but it's kind of that dynamic of a really closed off marriage sort of segregated from the rest of the world and 
the woman being really attentive to everything that's going on. And then one morning, it takes, all of it takes place in one day. And in the morning, um, she finds her husband dead. And then she has to go about her day with this knowledge. And of course, there's a lot of memory. There's a lot of observation. And although, of course, it takes place in one day, it doesn't mean that it stays in that temporality. So it's all about memory and sort of life. It becomes a little bit sinister as well. You don't know what's going on. Um, it is really good. I do recommend it if you're looking for a read that is really immersive, a little bit experimental in tone as well, very sort of, not even stream of consciousness, but very, yeah, from her perspective, a bit detached, I would say, a bit disoriented. Um, it was good, I liked it, um, but it is one of those books that I think is good, and it's just that, but I want to sort of rush to press into everyone's hand, but it will fill the mood. The other book that I do have a copy, I think it's just that I return it to the box set, is um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy Part 1. I'm just gonna get the book because I don't wanna have to put um, another box there. So a friend lent me the entire box set because back in Chile I have the bind up. I wanna read these books, but I don't want to buy another copy and clearly I shouldn't. Um, yeah, so I only read the first one, but I plan to read the second one maybe this month. We'll see. This month has been very busy, but we'll see. This, in case you don't know, it's like a classic of comedic sci-fi and it's about this man, Arthur, who is there, gets rescued just as um, the earth gets blown up and they go on this spaceship and there's all types of shenanigans going on and the companion or like the other main character I guess is this alien who has pretended to be a co-worker for years and he writes the guide for the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy um and it is this is what happened to me the first time I read it I think I definitely appreciated it a little bit more now that yeah, I know a little bit more of the humor and the context, but it's still, I find it a very exhausting book. I think it's a very, all the books are very short. I have never been able to read one in one sitting. It's like, I want to read one or two chapters and I enjoy them. But then I sort of need to stop, need to read something else. I find the humor very exhausting in a way that I don't find Good Omens exhausting, for example. I have not read any other Terry Pratchett, but... I think these sort of, although Terry Pratchett is fantasy, I think these two are sort of brought up in the same conversation. And yeah, I, so I can't compare it that way. But yeah, this humor, I find it good and funny, but yeah, very exhausting. I would not read these cover to cover in one sitting in spite of them being very short. So take that as you will. I still think it's like very fun and um, it is a classic and, you know, I'd like to be able to read and interact with classics. Then I also listened to the audiobook of Fever Pitch by Nick Hornby and I really like it. I love how Nick Hornby writes nonfiction. I've never read his fiction. For some reason, I have this idea that I wouldn't like it. I will give it a shot eventually, but yeah, it's not on the sort of priority list. But his nonfiction just gets me. I love how he writes about books. I love how he writes about his passions in general. Um, I think he's very successful at being very personable and very sort of self-deprecating, but in a fun way. And so this is his l account of his long-time relationship to football in general, but specifically to the Arsenal Football Club. And it's just really great. I will say, I think if I had been reading it as a physical copy, I would have gotten unnerved by all the football stuff because I like watching football. Definitely out of all the sports that are sort of team sports that I don't play, 
it's my favorite one to watch, if that makes sense. So like, I also like watching basketball a lot, but I like playing basketball. But football is one where it's like, I see the appeal of watching it, even though I don't play it. Um, and so I was somewhat interested, but sometimes it was so much. However, the reflections on fandom and how he does define, you know, being a football fan as a form of insanity. And he says it's someone with like a very specific sort of personality and how he uses it to cope and I don't know I found his views or like observations and reflections on the nature of the football fan to be endlessly fascinating and he addresses sort of hooligan culture he addresses like loyalty and sort of the dedication and how it affects his other relationships. It's its a whole thing. I found it fascinating. I do recommend it. The audiobook is superbly well read. And so, mwah, fantastic. I have another great audiobook, Nothing Ever Just Disappears by Diarmuid Hester. Um, this is, it, it's a very interesting book. It's, um I would call it like a work of psychogeography slash history with a dash of personal narrative. Um, it's about going to these iconic places where queer artists lived or worked and taking them as a starting point to see how the author feels about his own queerness and like reflect on the impact that the artists have had in history and in queer culture and beyond that also reflecting about their artistic practice and how it was shaped by their context both physical and sociological and historical it is really good um it got quite a bit well i don't know if it got like a big publicity push but it was like quite a it's it's a big book like physically and it's just fascinating. At first I was a bit skeptical because it sounded a bit meandering and a bit overindulgent in the introduction, but as I listened to the Josephine Baker one, oh it's because the Ian Forster one was a bit meh, but that may also be because I'm kind of sick of Ian Forster as a human, um, uh, but the Josephine Baker one was so interesting and it actually helped me think about bisexuality and how bi erasure has functioned in um history in very interesting ways and yeah the, it, that was great um and i didn't expect it to be so good and after that every chapter felt amazing and it also introduced me to queer artists that i didn't know about and so that was also great yeah i really i really loved it actually it's it's amazing okay so here's the funny thing i haven't met him personally but it is not the most unlikely thing he was sort of in the roster of names to be invited to an event that i was like assistant organizer to and in the end that didn't happen but i could have um and again because of the things that i'm working on right now it's not impossible and so i think i'm almost obligated to tell him that i was listening to his audiobook while I was having <laughs> my egg freezing procedure. So in more gruesome terms, as I was like being scraped from the inside out, <laughs> I had his voice in my ear because you could be listening to music or an audiobook or whatever while you had it done. And he reads his book himself. So I feel like I have such an intimate relationship to this book. Um, I don't know if it'll make my top of the year but it's definitely up there it's definitely a great book but also i just find it so funny i think i was saying like if i ever meet him i should definitely tell him this or i should write to him because it sounds to me like he would find it funny um maybe not i don't know but yeah it's a funny to me anecdote i'm sorry if that sort of is too crude for some people. Regardless of that, it is a really good book. He is a really good narrator as well, which we know authors not always are necessarily, but in this case he is. Uh, but I'm sure because the prose reads beautifully, I'm sure it will be just as 
good on paper so pick it up okay on to physical books another one that has an interesting story is this one Shued by Claire Oshetsky and I heard about this book when it first came out however I had kind of forgotten and then I was watching Patricia Taxon's video called on the ethics of boinking animal people which is all about furries um, and sort of what furry art is. Let me tell you, it is one of my favorite video essays of all time. I just think it's such a gold standard for defining sort of aesthetic movements and also it goes into autism and uh, transness in a way that I found so compelling and fascinating. So if you are feeling a little bit adventurous, regardless of your own I don't know, like, relationship to first, I guess. Just check it out, because it is really, really fascinating. Anyways, she talks about this book there, and cites a video fragment from uh, Jen Campbell, where Jen talks about how if her mom had written about her in these terms, she would have been destroyed. And then Patricia was like, hey, it was me. And so it was her mom who wrote this book um and I, I was just so fascinated and the book is dedicated to her and then there is sort of music because there's a lot of music in this book um and there's sort of like work cited with music here and uh, a lot of that is music that patricia taxon has made herself so i think that is just fascinating sort of extraneous context but the book itself is also amazing. I just, I don't know why I self-censored freaking. It's not even. Anyways, um, so this is about, I would say you can firmly categorize it as magical realism. It's about this woman who one night an owl lover who is female and that is very interesting so that that was a, the choice um comes and impregnates her and then she is pregnant and she is pregnant with an owl baby and her husband is really excited about it and she's like no 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 you don't understand and she thinks about abortion uh, but doesn't go through with it and then it's about raising this owl baby who is feral and complicated but also she loves it it's about how dehumanizing being a first-time mom but also the mom of a non-conforming child that's how um she talks about um like i think in the dedication or at some point she says like to all non-conforming children something like that as well um or like maybe at the end i don't know but yeah so th that's how she thinks about it and it's just beautiful and heart-wrenching and fascinating it's also beautifully written but what happens is so impactful and i will say it's magical realism even though sort of the husband and the clearly it is all symbolic but at the same time there is a reality like tangible reality the two are not separated is what i would say even though at the beginning everyone is like what are you talking about oh baby you crazy woman but then the metaphor gets pushed harder when they try to turn shuet uh into which is the name of the baby uh but everyone calls her charlotte and so there is that one thing it's like already trying to push her into this mold and they try to convert her to normality to um into a it's like a dog baby or like a dog child because like dogs are obedient and it's just so good i didn't expect to be glued to this but it tore me apart i think it's fascinating it, it is so well crafted it is brutal but in a very honest and just delicate way oh i highly highly recommend i also read diary of a void that is kind of similar in this way where it's brutal um but you know good so um this is by amy yagi of course and it's translated from the japanese by david void and lucy north 
um, both, I think, very sort of famous translators. Um, and this, as everyone almost uh, knows, is about this woman who, because she's so sick of having to do all this work, like extra work, like almost secretarial work at an office where she isn't supposed to do that. Um, so like cleaning the dishes and all these things because she's a woman, she suddenly lies and says she is pregnant. Um, but as time progresses, things get more complicated. The way this resolved things was so delicate and so... I understand... Okay, so here's what I'll say. I think prose-wise, it's just okay. And also I understand why people might be like a little bit underwhelmed, but I actually think it's brilliant. I think the commentary by the events that occur is just fascinating how he talks about how Japanese society, and I think you could make a point of that, uh, like the world treats pregnant people and how hard it is especially if you're by yourself and the different attitudes uh, it's just again the ending i thought was so brilliant and you know a little bit optimistic as well i think i love that it wasn't sort of tragic um yeah please check it out especially if you like something like the housekeeper and the professor although this is not as saccharine as that it, it mm, hits some of the same beats i would say and yeah uh, really highly recommend. I also reread Piranesi by Susanna Clark, and this I reread because my bookshop co runs a book club, and that was that month's book club. And I was pleased to report that it so holds up, and everyone at the book club liked it. This is a fantasy, although not as fantastic as you would think, maybe, book. Um, so it's, I think it's really good for literary readers who want something spookier or more atmospheric and want to dive into fantasy, but yeah, don't want to deal with the world building and, and also want some like substance to their fantasy. And, um, or like, if you like sort of weird fiction, I think this is also good. It's not as weird as Annihilation, but I can see the same reader enjoying both for example. Anyways, this is about someone who is in this labyrinthine house. We are not exactly sure where he is, but he keeps um, journals of everything and he has his tasks, he goes about the house, etc. We don't know what's going on because he doesn't know exactly what's going on, and he has encounters with this figure who calls him Piranesi as a joke because of, um, if you Google Piranesi, it's this artist who created um, paintings of like stairs that go nowhere and it's very sort of fever dreamish. And yeah, it starts like that. It's very creepy. We have no idea what's going on. The place as well is so hard to imagine. It's vast and again, labyrinthine, it has um, a ruin sort of, I don't know, influence because there's like statues, but also there's nature in there, there's tides and birds, and it's, oh, it is so atmospheric, it is so good. And then as you understand what's going on and as the sort of truth becomes unveiled, it becomes even more interesting. And so just highly recommend. It's such a great read. Please check it out. Something very short but also really good, The Lydia Steptoe Stories by Juna Barnes. Basically, Juna Barnes published three stories that are all in the form of diaries under the pseudonym Lydia Steptoe, and they are all about sexual transgression in different ways. Um, they are really good. Uh, it's really interesting how she creates different voices for three different characters, and even though they are really, really short, there's three stories here. You still get the point across. Again, even I think these would have worked as well as like novellas um, and expanding them. But yeah, it's short but powerful. Uh, really interesting to consider um, as, and especially read together as you know, you consider the age and gender of the people involved. Yeah, 
just really, really interesting stuff in there. I would highly recommend. I read The Young Man by Annie Arnaud because we got a copy at the shop. And I don't know, I haven't read her most influential books. So I haven't read, you know, The Years or Happening or um, Girls on Story. I find Annie Arnaud just okay. <laughs> I, it seems so weird to say when it's here, it says winner of the Nobel Prize in Literature. I understand. It's like, who the F are you? Um, these are translated, by the way, by Alison L. Strayer. Anyways, this is her story of um, being in a relationship with a really, really young man. <laughs> so she's, I don't know, in her 40s, I think, when this happened and the guy was a student, which by which I think it means a college student, so like 20, um, so half her age, about, I, I don't know if the maths check out, sorry. But uh, also, by the way, when I first read the synopsis, I thought it was one of her students and I became very alarmed, but no, it's it's just a student. Um, yeah, and, and it's interesting, it has some interesting reflections, it's just that, I don't know. I I love memoirs. Um and I love memoir as a form. It's just that with like these really episodic snippets I don't know. There are there are passages that are brilliant and I I think they are very interesting, but because it's so short, because it's so episodic, I don't know, there's something in me that I'm not exactly sure what it is because I don't mind short books in general. I Oh, also, I did Shorty September. I think I said that in the... Yeah, so a lot of these short things are because of Shorty September. Um, so clearly, it's not a problem. It's just that with Annie no, it always feels a little bit half-baked, even though some of the reflections are really interesting. It's just there's something there that... I read it, and I'm like, yeah, that's, that's all right. Like, three stars, 3.5. I don't know. Tell me what you think. Do you think I would feel different if I read sort of her more famous books. I also read Summer Fun by Jean Thornton or Jean? No, Jean. I'm choosing to do to say Jean. Um, and this is described as The Pet Sounds of Trans Literature, a masterpiece by Tori Peters, whose The Transition Baby I have yet to read. Um, that is one book that if I found secondhand, I would buy it because I feel like it's kind of mandatory reading at this point, even though... I fear I'm not gonna like it. It's okay. I'm gonna read it anyways. Um, this was fantastic. Although it's another one of those books that's very unique and I don't know if I would recommend it to everyone. Um, it's an epistolary novel where this trans woman is writing to the lead singer of this band called The Get Happies and sort of telling her her own story, which is very sinister. It just reads like such a sinister project. And yeah, she writes also about her own life. She is working at a motel and she encounters the grand daughter of this singer. And we gather early on that the singer is also trans. Um, and it goes on to, again, both the story of the band and the story of... Um, this the the writer um gala um and again it has this like really weird almost fever dreamish quality to it because it is a fan effectively and also a fan so this is another interesting thing because they were famous i don't know i think in the 70s or something and then this fan is reliving this stuff i think in the noughties so okay quintessential uh, 1960s California band and then Gala is I think either in the 90s or the 2000s or maybe even the 2010s so like there's been f at least 30-40 years between the Get Happies and Gala and so why is this fan recounting this story and telling it to this person so of course plot wise it is so we can get the story but there is something so sinister about it I find um and that makes you ask questions of narrative and whose story is it and how can you know someone's story 
um it's just fascinating and the end gave me a little bit of chills in a very sad way it's like a very sad complicated thing um i think it is a really interesting look at trans temporality i just found it strangely engrossing it is like a little bit overwrought like it is long but it mm, was worth it so if you're interested in any of these things if you like a good sort of 60s story that's a little bit dense that is sort of feels like it could have been brought up at that time i think you should really check this out it's just interesting in a very not ethereal but there is there is a quality to it that makes it really mesmerizing even though maybe it doesn't come together as tightly as i usually like my books to be i think it's fascinating and i enjoyed reading it and i would definitely reread it and i probably will in the future and the same can be said of this book milfed by melissa broder now i have not read anything else by melissa broder yet i will definitely do that it's just because her books didn't sound interesting to me until i heard about this one so the pisces sounds like just okay but this one oh yeah big trigger warning for eating disorder like if you don't want to read about people counting calories and being obsessed with their weight then don't read this book because it, it is about all of that all right so rachel is this culturally jewish but not religious woman who um is obsessed with her weight and works at I is it like an agency Hollywood yeah sort of there's a lot of, around there about you know body standards and whatever and she goes to these froyo plays and always gets the same order um, which is very specific and it's sort of her big pleasure although everything is calculated and falls in love with this woman named Miriam who is religious Jewish and also fat and so they start hanging out and it is at first very unclear whether the friendship will you know become a relationship or what kind of relationship it can become my colleague at the bookshop who recommended it initially said that the one thing it's not that she was confused but a bit unsure about was that she's not certain about what the book is actually saying so is the book sort of anti-calorie restriction or is the book i don't know what is the point i guess is was her question and while i was reading it to me it was so much about control and repression and freedom and sort of the dangers of so much depression and suddenly become free because the ending no spoilers but basically everything collapses and it's just this author was unafraid to just create this character who's so profoundly unlikable but also very human and very vulnerable and then sets her life on fire and takes no prisoners and doesn't give enough it's just fantastic so i can see why people wouldn't like it i can see how people would find it a bit unsatisfying or unfulfilled because it seems like there is no point but to me the point is to illustrate this profound repression of everything like the potential of humans to sort of we have all these desires and all this hunger um that for Rachel is of course food but also there's a lot of sexuality in there and in a way Miriam is much more settled um and of course she just eats with delight and that is great to see but she's also repressed in other ways and i think it's showing how there is no one way to be repressed um and it's just it was so refreshing to see that you know the point is to just explore this i one idea in my opinion and not have to justify it <laughs> so it doesn't have like this one message it doesn't have this one point it's just like these people who are very repressed and all this tension and this yeah um hunger and how it plays with that it's just fascinating and so i don't care that it seems like it was pointless because the point of the book in my opinion is to just show you this and i think melissa broder was so unapologetic about it that 
I it worked for me and I think it was really really well written and I just really really enjoyed it. If that section seems more cut than usual it's because i kept feeling that i had already spoken about that book and so i'm going to go back to my previous wrap-ups to see if that had been the case but if not i think it might have been because i tried to film this at some point and ended up being too tired and so i deleted those files which was a shame because i remember being very eloquent about that book in particular and i feel like i wasn't just now so i don't know what's that about i'm gonna again look into it well if i never catch it then whoops you'll have to listen to me talking about uh milk fed twice you can always skip it you know whatever the next book that i'm going to talk about is with the animals by justin torres and i did talk about this book once because i hold it in my med cool people bought books video down below um, and in the eye as always and uh, this I got a case award because Justin Soros is coming up with a new book after like 10 years or something and I can't wait this is sort of a queer coming of age classic at this point it's very short and it's about three I want to say three siblings um, growing up so they are Latin X and they are growing up in uh, New York, upstate New York, and it's heartbreaking because it's told. So at first, it's told through a more collective voice, as like we, and then it's really interesting to see how that we becomes I. Again, I feel like I've said this already. It's very, very strange, and I don't think it's deja vu. I think I filmed this. Anyways, let's just let's just continue. It is heartbreaking it is so beautifully written well it is child narration because it is first person collective and i know when you say that people are going to be like oh i don't want to read that but i think the fact that it's ch children like you see it through the eyes of the children it's just so heartbreaking because their understanding is limited but you understand what's happening but also you get the sense especially as they're growing up that they understand more than before and they are sort of almost avoiding thinking about it and then sort of the main protagonist, the, the I that stands from the we um, starts quote unquote showing signs of queerness and what happens after is just entirely heartbreaking and yeah it is really good, it, it, it is fascinating, it depicts a version of um, the immigrant experience and it also depicts a version of like toxic marriages and sort of violent, turbulent, passionate marriages and how it affects the children. It's just beautiful. Um, it also talks about the complexity of sibling relationships. It's considered both a novel and some people think of it as a collection of short stories, like a novel in stories kind of thing. I think it's definitely a novel. I don't think you could read these out of order and feel like oh yeah I got everything I think the progression is important so I would say I don't even consider them like short stories I consider them vignettes and so it is very fragmentary but it is still a novel so you get this sense of oh the we as a pack the the, the children and then as they grow up one um sort of begins to differentiate himself and all of them become sort of more individuals um it's it's really good it's again heartbreaking but in a in a great way in my opinion two more books to tell you about um one is hair power essays on control and freedom by kajal odredra and this is like a little um 404 inklings book and this was good um it was interesting i think it could have just been pushed so much further though it seems very superficial you know you read the back and it's like hair is potent it's present and and its absence has profound influence upon our lives across race, gender, sexuality, status, and more. It will go in places you don't like and it may desert you suddenly or gradually. Whatever you experience, you have had a relationship with hair and its power. I did highlight some things, but not as much as I expected. I, I guess it's fine. I would recommend it. It's short. It has some good points, but it was not mind-blowing. And I think it could have been mind-blowing even as short as it was. It's always hard with these essays I think to balance sort of personal narrative with theory or with more sort of broader accounts and I understand that. Finally I have The Descent of Man by Grayson Perry and this is an essay that 
um, or like a yeah book length essay. Published in 2016, for some reason this feels older and I would be very interested in looking up, I haven't done this yet because I don't have uh, the time at the moment, but I, I will definitely do it. To hear Grace and Perry weigh in in the current sort of gender slash trans debate because it seems to me that he is very liberated in some ways but I could also see from reading this book how it could be taken as can't you just be like a transvestite or can't you just be a um you know, non-conforming, whatever your gender is, um, and you know, you can't change sex kind of arguments stemming from this book. So I think it's it's like interesting. So basically this is a manifesto um, about masculinity and it comes with really interesting like satirical cartoons. And there is one in particular that I want to show you. Role models, so like different role models for children. Um, one of them is uh, Trantastico, superpowers, gender fluidity, brushes of embarrassing misunderstandings with good grace. And so I find it interesting because I think, again, there is such power in being like, it doesn't matter what your gender is, you can dress whatever, you can present whatever. But there were things here that under the current climate, which again, it's different from what it was seven years ago, um, I, I raised a few flags. So basically, um, Grayson Perry defines himself as a transvestite, as someone who sort of finds erotic titillation in cross-dressing. But he does use the word dysphoria for himself here a couple times. And he does express the sort of, if only clothes would transform you into the other sex. And then he also does say that he knows nothing about the female experience, but he is a adequately positioned to talk about masculinity, which again, is not a problem. And I think it's really valuable to have a man who frequently cross dresses and has transvestism as an identity talking about gender roles. I think that is really, really rich. There was a, an essentialism that is not biological because he is very much like, all of these are learned and men can be different and blah, blah, blah. It's really interesting to See where he talks about his sort of more quote unquote traditionally masculine traits in his own personality. And he was like, there was a time where I really wanted to sort of eradicate all of that. And now I've gotten more comfortable with both. And I think all of that is fascinating. Um, he also, in terms of prose, he is a really, really fun writer and really interesting. And he makes his points with like a lightness of touch and humor that I really respect. I loved his book, Playing to the Gallery. I just, mwah, I think that book is amazing. Although I would reread it because at that time I didn't know a lot about the art world, whereas this is a topic that I do know a lot about. So there was a way where the idea of like people being transgender didn't really occur to him or didn't enter this conversation, which was interesting given the parameters of the conversation. If anyone else has read this, please let me know your thoughts. I don't know. I'm just like curious. It's not, it didn't make me angry. It just made me squint and think like, huh, what does he think now kind of thing? And I haven't looked it up. So I'm again, I'm not making any claims about this book. I did find it really interesting. It is very sort of masculinity, 101 but i think that was kind of the point of the book because um it was published by alan lane and it's published for like a broader audience and i think it's really really helpful i think so many people should read it it's just that in the current political climate um with rampant transphobia and some of the talking points overlapping i'm like huh anyways those are um the rest of the books that i read in september um, it was a great reading month. October, on the other hand, is not that it's been a bad reading month. I've actually been reading a lot, but I've been a little bit all over the place. And so I've finished not a lot of books, which, you know what, at this point, I, it's going to be good because that means I can just wrap it up and then quickly and then catch up with the other wrap ups. And let me know what you've been reading, anything else, if you've read any of these books, if you want to read any of these books after hearing me talk about them. And that is it. See you next time.